poverty. And so last week we considered um, the, uh, the uh, non-Christian man and the newborn Christian. And in this study, we're going to look at the normal Christian and what I call the negligent Christian. The negligent Christian. So, since this is part two of our study in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 3, 4, I want to reiterate a part of last week's introduction. Now, many people teach from this passage concerning three kinds of people, three kinds of men. And if you just do a superficial reading of these verses, it can yield to that kind of thinking. But what we've already seen is that's not accurate or adequate. Actually, there are four kinds of people pictured in this text, and every person on earth is in one of them at this very moment. But again, in uh, rehearsing what we did last week, let me say this, uh, read this paragraph. The Bible knows nothing about a permanent class of followers of Jesus called carnal Christians. There are only two classes of all mankind. Those are lost or saved, believers or unbelievers, Christians or non-Christians. And there's only one kind of believer those who are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now, please once more, get this. There is no such thing as a believer who is carnal, worldly, fleshly, all the time, all their life. That person, whomever they think they are, they're not a believer. They're not saved. So listen again. There's no such thing as a believer who's carnal all the time. And don't miss this. There's no such thing as a believer who is not carnal some of the time. I bet some of you, with the exception of my wife and me, have been carnal this week. <laughs> oh, why are you laughing? You're laughing because you know that at least I have been carnal. My wife is too sweet to be carnal in the sense that you think carnal, but I know carnality when I see it, and I'm smart enough not to call her carnal, okay? I'm some dumb, but not blum dumb. <laughs> so, uh, we're, going to, we're going to consider uh, the third type of person, but before I do consider the normal Christian, I, I want to show you something that where a lot of this carnal teaching. Actually, it was even earlier than that. Dallas, the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary, Dr. Lewis Perry Chafer, is the one who really began to teach this. And even earlier, he adapted it from the Schofield Reference Bible, about three classes of men. And, 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 and like they were permanent almost within those classes. But Campus Crusade picked up on this. They had a, and still have, they call it by a different name now, the booklet, the little track, Four Spiritual Laws. And then they had another one called, Have You Made the Wonderful Discovery of the Spirit-Filled Life? And I'm not depreciating, denigrating the work of Campus Crusade for Christ over the years. It's now called CRU, C-R-U. And they've led literally hundreds of thousands to Christ on college campuses around the world. But in their little track on how uh, have you uh, the question if you made the discovery of the spirit filled life? They have uh, what's called number one, the natural man, and they call this the self directed life. That circle represents the real you on the inside, the heart, the totality of your personality. And there's a chair there that represents a throne, and self is on the throne, and the interests of the natural man are directed by self, which is absolutely true. And it says resulting in discord and frustration. And, and that's true uh, some of the time. Uh, it's true all of the time as far as finding ultimate meaning in life is concerned. But Christ, you'll notice, is outside of the life. All right? That was the natural man. And then there's what they referred to as the spiritual man. This is the Christ-directed life. And you see the cross representing Christ is on the chair, on the throne. So Christ is on the throne. And where's self? It's down 
off where self should be, not on the throne, not running, not run, you're not running your own life. So the interests are directed by Christ, and the results is harmony with God's plan. Ah, but then there's a third man, and um, they call this the carnal man, the self-directed life. Self is on the throne. Christ is dethroned and not allowed to direct the life. Now, that's, that, that's not true. Even when a believer sins, Jesus doesn't get off the throne. When he comes in, he comes in as Lord, and he's Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. And when you act selfishly and sinfully and carnally and worldly, Jesus, if you're saved, is still on the throne. So he doesn't get dethroned. So, but what happened is, and we'll see, I'm getting ahead of myself as far as definition. Let me just pause there and, 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 and check myself and go back and get on the main thing, okay? So we're going we're gonna to get to the main, main thing. Let's look at the, uh, what, what uh, I call the normal Christian. Uh, verse 15 again of chapter 2 says that um, uh, let, let me read it from another translation uh, chapter th uh, 2 verse 15 but he who is spiritual appraises all things yet he himself is appraised by no one discerns all things but he's not discerned that has the idea of judgment is judged judging in the right sense of, of, of discernment now the word for spiritual man, uh, what does ESV say about that? Verse uh, 15. The spiritual person judges all things. The spiritual person judges all things. The word for spiritual there is the word pneumatikos, pneuma spirit. And the ending, I-K-O-S ending, means that this is the chief characteristic, the chief characteristic of this person's life, spiritual. Now, notice in particular in your outline these uh, prepositions that, that um, I should have underlined because they're big, big prepositions. What are the characteristics of the normal Christian? And again, this is normal Christianity. This is not somebody who's arrived, somebody who's, quote, gotten baptized, filled with the Spirit, operating in the gifts of the Spirit, has uh, more degrees than the thermometer, can parse Greek verbs and dig up Hebrew roots. No, no, no. This is normal Christian. Just normal Christian living. Number one, he lives by and in the Spirit. Verse 12, chapter 2. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. And then another reference is in Galatians 5.25. Let's read it together nice and loud, okay? If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Notice the emphasis, if we live by the Spirit. So this normal Christian lives by the Spirit. And here's some things that that means, living by the Spirit and in the Spirit. Number one, he's born again by the Spirit. Titus 3, verse 5. Let's read that. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So he's born again by the Spirit. Secondly, he's indwelt by the Spirit. Romans 8, 9. Let's read that. You, however are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. Wow, that's a big, big, big passage of Scripture uh, loaded with meaning. So what he says is normal Christian living begins the moment the Spirit of God regenerates you and takes up residence within you. And if that's not the case, then you're not a Christian. He says, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. What? If, in fact, the spirit of God does what? Well, in dwell, or dwells in you. So he's born again by the spirit. He's indwelt by the spirit. He's infilled by the spirit. Ephesians 5, 18. Let's read that. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. 
And that word there, be filled, the, the verb be filled is present tense, which denotes continuous action. So the normal Christian life is to be constantly, continuously, and conspicuously being filled with the Spirit of God. And not only that, but number four, he walks in the Spirit, prays in the Spirit, worships in the Spirit, loves in the Spirit. Not 100% of the time, listen, nobody has arrived in spite of what some denominations teach you about arriving where they don't ever sin anymore. Like I mentioned to some of you in, in private, most people that I've encountered that claim that, I can make sin in a short while. <laughs> they may call it something else, but it's not hard to make somebody sin if you just intend upon, you know, calling them uh, dumb and liars and stupid. and uh, Not that I would do anything like that. You, you know me better than, than doing that. Everybody except my wife. <laughs> okay, so, but, but the character, the, 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 the foremost characteristic of a normal Christian is they're walking in the Spirit. And, and again, that's not just when you're doing something you consider spiritual, everything for the normal Christian is spiritual because we don't divide it up into spiritual on Sunday and spiritual in Bible class and, and then, then secular and carnal beginning as soon as we get out the door or throughout next week. All right, so he lives by and in the Spirit. Secondly, he learns from the Spirit. Unlike the natural man who operates by the or principle, you remember what the OR principle is? O-R-E, observation, rationalization, and experimentation. The spiritual man functions by these four things. Number one, revelation. 1 Corinthians 2.10. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. And by the way, what he's talking to about being revealed to us is said in verse 9. Things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and which we haven't even thought about. It hasn't even entered our heart. Those things that God has prepared for those that love him, that's not about heaven. That's about beginning now. And the revelation by the Spirit of God is that when the gospel came in, with that came the ability to, to enjoy God. Really, that's what it's about. It's not about having deep insight into certain things and into Scripture. It's about knowing God and therefore being able to enjoy Him and having a desire to go on knowing Him in ever-increasing levels of intimacy. Revelation, illumination, verse 11. Uh, even the, No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God just like no man knows himself and other men don't know you except the spirit of man which is in him. So there's illumination on the revelation that God has given us. And that is through the word of God, uh, we have by the spirit of God, he, he turns on the light so that we're able to perceive and thus receive. And then he operates not only by revelation and illumination, but by inspiration, inspire. That means, the word spire means to breathe, and it means to breathe in. The Spirit of God is the pneuma, the breath of God. The, the Old Testament word, the Hebrew word for uh, the, the Spirit is ruach, and it means the, the breath, the ruach, inspiration. So, uh, no one by nature, under the influence of reason and sense and passion is disposed to investigate the the truth of God and understand it. I mean you can get you can get some understanding and get a technical sense of it, but you can't get a personal, intimate sense of what the scripture really is designed for. So there's inspiration. And then number four, there's application verse 13 of chapter 2, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So the normal Christian, the spiritual man, knows that the condition of one's heart is more important in understanding the Bible 
than the capabilities of one's mind. Now to borrow my mentor's expression, Herb Hodges, that just ran past your dock and didn't unload. So I'm going to back up and say it again, okay? Listen closely. The spiritual man knows that the condition of one's heart is more important in understanding the Bible than the capabilities of one's mind. He knows that the best interpreter of the Bible isn't the Bible itself, but the author of the Bible. Now, now we, we, there's a common evangelical expression. The best interpreter of the Bible is the Bible. No, it isn't. The best interpreter of the Bible is the author of the Bible, and the author of the Bible is the Spirit of God. This is the, the, the theonustos, the God-breathed word. So the assumption on the part of so many is that if they have a good mind, good training in the original languages of Hebrew and Greek, and good study habits that they're far superior in the interpretation of Revelation. And that is not so just naturally. Yes, if they're, if they're walking in the Spirit and trusting the Holy Spirit for illumination rather than just their reason, yes, that's, that, that's a real advantage. But the spiritual man, the normal Christian person, understands that if a man can't be saved apart from miraculous revelation of the Spirit of God, neither can he understand or rightly interpret Scripture apart from the same. Do you understand what I'm saying? If it takes the Holy Spirit, it took the Holy Spirit to give us the Word of God, then it takes the Holy Spirit to interpret that Word to us rather than us just looking it up in a good commentary or a concordance or something of that nature. And then there's another characteristic of the spiritual man. They're liberated through the Spirit. They're supernaturally natural. The spiritual person understands matter with a true wisdom. He discerns. He understands the true virtue and value of things. That's what this really means. He, doesn't, he understands the real value of something, the real virtue in something. And we said concerning the natural man, he knows the price of everything, but the value of nothing. So the spiritual person is uh, he understands matters with a true wisdom, the wisdom of God. He is an unexplainable mystery to the world. He can't figure you out. They don't know exactly what it is that makes you different because they know that you don't have uh, access to all the information that they may have or not as smart as they are, but you have insight and you operate by a wisdom that they can't explain. And then the, he is uniformly maturing in his walk. Listen closely. There's no such thing as a mature Christian. There's only a maturing Christian. If you think you've arrived and you can't mature anymore, you need to get your funeral services in order because you're not long for this world. There's no point of leaving you here because this is, the, this is what, one of the very reasons why we're left here, and that is to, in, to, to encounter problems so that we learn how to solve those problems in the power of God. And in the process, be changed as we depend upon God and learn to trust Him and obey Him in all things. And then number four, He labors with and by the Spirit. He labors, He works with, cooperates with the Spirit of God and by the power of the Spirit of God. In other words, He has access to the power tools of the Spirit. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And, and um, so again, you can access the power tools, which these Corinthians did, and still not be a normal Christian, be subnormal, be a babe. So just operating in the gifts of the Spirit doesn't mean that you're a maturing Christian. These people operated in all the gifts of the Spirit. That's one of the problems. Now we'll look at that more in detail when we come to those passages. So that's the normal Christian. And again, it's, it's, it's not for a special group. It's not for someone who's gotten a, a second, third blessing. It's, it's, it's normal Christian living. But here's the, here's the fourth category. It's, it's not a... I, I has, let me just clear that up. Here's the fourth type of Christian, and it's a temporary position and that's what I call the negligent Christian the negligent Christian this is what chapter 3 
uh, deals with, uh, the, at least the first um, four verses here. The negligent Christian. Let me, let me read a, a comment here from a Reformed Baptist uh, named Ernie Riesinger. And he, he's writing concerning the carnal Christian teaching. He said, the carnal Christian teaching was invented to accommodate all the supposed converts of modern evangelism, which has left biblical repentance out of its message. I'm referring to those who make decisions, walk aisles, and profess to be Christians while their lives remain unchanged by the power of the Holy Spirit. They are people who do not love what Christians love or hate what Christians hate because these supposed converts think and behave like non-Christians. Their teachers have devised an explanation for their unchanged lives. They have invented the unbiblical category of carnal Christian. The carnal Christian idea is a part of the non-lordship to experience theory of the Christian life. Stage one is conversion. The decision to receive Christ as one's personal savior and escape hell. Stage two, a later decision makes Christ Lord. Between these two stages or experiences, the supposed convert may live like a non-Christian. A testimony would be something like this. Well, when I was seven or eight years old, I received Christ as my personal savior, but I did not make him my Lord until much later in life. There's a Greek word for that. It's called baloney. There's no, that, that's, not, that's not true. You know, you, I don't care if you're saved, you may have not understood much about what was going on, but Jesus came in as Lord. He doesn't come in to, to save you from your sins. He came in, first of all, to save you from your sins, of the, which the essence is yourself. And he comes in as Lord. But, but we've made this. This was a big controversy in, uh, in, in a number of years past and still is in some circles today. But, but what this is is just a revival of the old, quote, second blessing teaching in new garb, a teaching that sends Christians on a quest for an instantaneous holiness that doesn't exist. It divides justification and sanctification. You can be justified and not be sanctified. Again, let me use that Greek word, baloney. I, I, know, I know better than that. That's Tennessee vernacular, bologna. <laughs> But it's bologna. It's sausage. It, it, it's not true. So, notice Paul uses two different words, and they're almost the same. Some scholars say they, they're uh, synonymous. In, in verse 1, he uses the word for flesh or carnal, sarkinos. Uh, um, and then, uh, uh, sarkinos means made of flesh. And then the other word is sarkikos, and that's the one he uses concerning the, the, uh, the Corinthians, that they are no longer, they shouldn't be babies, but they're still acting like fleshly people. And these are blameworthy. There's nothing wrong with being a baby when you're supposed to be a baby. But if you're still a baby after many years, then something is radically wrong. So they were acting like they were still con being made of and controlled by the flesh. One, one translation uses uh, fleshy uh, for in verse 1, uh, fleshy, and then in verse 3, fleshly. And I think that's a good uh, distinction. So he's talking to people that are, that are, that are flesh, fleshly and carnal, and worldly, but they, they are in trouble because of that. So here are the characteristics of the negligent Christian. Number one, they're deformed as far as maturity is concerned. What's the cause of deformity? Number one, sparing the flesh. Sparing the flesh. That means settling down with, well, I'm just that way by nature. I, I, I'm Irish in nature, therefore I got a bad temper. I'm Scottish by nature, therefore I'm stingy. I, I'm, uh, 
this by nature. Therefore, that's just who I am by nature. It doesn't make any difference what you are by nature. You are a new creation and have a new nature. And so all that counts with God is who he has made you and is in the process of making you. So we spare the flesh and that causes deformity. Another, as, another cause of deformity is succumbing to the flesh. Th that means feeding it. Remember how we defined flesh last week? Change right flesh, drop the H and flip it. And it spells what? S-E-L-L. -L. Not, not me, the real me, but, but that twisted part of me that was twisted by the fall. This is self right here. It, it, it's, it's, always, it's always life with the hook. What's in it for me? What can I get out of it? How's this going to... How's this going to affirm me? How's this going to uh, assure me? How's this going to help me? And so many of the believers in Corinth were converted from paganism, but they were uh, out of their previous experience. They lived in one of the most corrupt and sexually immoral societies in ancient history. And so they were... They, they were still dealing with some of those issues. And, and in addition to that, uh, the majority, or at least a number of them in the church at Corinth, were intentionally rebelling against God. Oh, let me correct that. We're not intentionally rebelling against God, but we're simply ignorant of the ways of God of Scripture, immature in their spiritual understanding, while being influenced by false apostles and deceitful workers. By the way, that reference is in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. So he said, the time has come that you ought to be more mature than you are, but you're still acting like babies. Now, listen closely to this statement. Maturity is not produced by the additions of raw truth over long periods of time. Maturity isn't produced by adding more truth from Scripture over long periods of time. One can make a lot of additions without growing. I stopped growing a long time ago in my body. Any additions I make now is called getting fat. <laughs> but you see, again, there's, there's deformity. Well, uh, the old uh, Puritan John Owen said, sin is never less quiet than when it seems to be most quiet and its waters are for the most part deep when they're still. So you, what you have to keep in mind is this. Sin, the flesh, is always acting and seducing and conceiving and tempting. And though we've been delivered from the rule of sin and Jesus is Lord we're still the objects of incessant guerrilla warfare, uh, war attack, warfare attacks from a threefold enemy, the world, the devil, and here's the primary enemy, the flesh, the person on the inside of me. The Great Wall of China protected it from enemies for centuries with the exception of three times, three times the enemy came through the wall. You know how they got through the wall? Somebody on the inside opened the gate. Guess what? There's a powerful world system attacking me, alluring me. There's a powerful devil and demons uh, trying to assist that alluring attraction. But the real enemy is me on the inside. And the times that I've sinned, the times that I've acted in the flesh, and I'm not talking about those uh, drinking, cussing, smoking, lust. Uh, I, I, those, those we can, I'm talking about mental attitude sins like bitterness and anger and resentment, those kind of things. The times that I've done that, it's been an inside job. It, it hasn't been because you made me do it. It's your fault. No, it's, it's me, myself, and I that I have to blame. And then another characteristic of this person is their disposition is mean. <clears throat> They're continually the object of ministry without the ability or willingness to minister. Let's read this together. Hebrews 5, verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, 
You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. Another characteristic of this negligent Christian, they are feelings oriented and motivated, easily offended, very touchy and quarrelsome, and quickly lose motivation. That's what he says in verse 3. For since there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and acting like mere men? And, and then uh, Hebrews 5, 11, let's read that. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Dull of hearing. Why is hearing so important? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. All right. Then thirdly, he's unteachably anchored to a foundational message. Hebrews 6, verse 1. Let's read that. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. In other words, this person has trouble with change. They want to hold on to tradition. They want to hold on to, to something of the past or to a past experience. And their testimony is, well, you, when, when I was such and such age at such and such place, I had this incredible encounter with God and that was 40 years ago. I'm not interested. I want to know about what's God doing in your life now. What, 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 where's your walk with God now? Here's the truth. Living things grow and growing things change. But by nature, the only person who likes change is a baby with a wet diaper. <laughs> We're just naturally opposed to change. But that's another factor of the, quote, carnal person. And then they are constantly in motion and easily misled. Ephesians 4.14, read it with me so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Ah, but here's number four. And listen, this is very, very important. Don't miss this. The Heavenly Father's discipline is meted out to these types of individuals. So here's the summation of this. The time for being fleshly or carnal is short and the treatment is severe. Once again, let me repeat that for emphasis and for the fact that it is tremendously serious. The time for being fleshly or carnal is short and the treatment is severe. Father God will either redirect the carnal Christian through chastening to a progressive, productive, normal Christian life or remove them by premature death. Now that's pretty serious. Now, let, me, let me explain what that means. He'll kill you. Okay. You say, oh my goodness. Not God. Well, ask, when you get to heaven, ask the Corinthians about it. Let's, let's read this passage. 1 Corinthians 11, 29 through 32, and we'll sum this up. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Wow. So what, what that means is, yes, if you settle down in a position as a normal Christian where you're living in the flesh and feeding your flesh and, and, and think that you can get by by, quote, just being a carnal Christian, you're deceiving yourself. You have been deceived and you, you are being disciplined. And if there's no discipline in your life, then there's reason you need to question whether or not you're a Christian at all. Because whom the Father loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you be without chastisement of whom all are partakers, then you're illegitimate and not his sons. 
So a sure indication that you're a child of God is you can't get by with living in sin or trying to sin. You can't get by with it. He convicts you in order to change you, and each level becomes more severe until finally he'll say, mm, can't trust you anymore. I'll bring you home. Now, don't. Well, I, I'm going, I've got a whole teaching on that. Uh, but it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and, and uh, we'll do that when we get there. So, again, there's no such category as a carnal Christian who's going to heaven, going to miss hell, just because they made a decision umpteen years ago, and they've lived like hell their whole life. And that's not going to happen. Now, on the other hand, I don't know how long the period of carnality is. I don't know how long God will put up with the flesh. For, for example, with the children of Israel, they got by with a lot of things, but eventually God disciplined them severely in, in the wilderness. But Moses only did one thing. He, he, he struck a rock when God told him to speak to it, and it cost him his life. He didn't get to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And you know what happened to him? God killed him. <laughs> you know, you need to use better terminology. Well, admittedly, but but he said today's the day. He, he took Aaron a little while earlier, and then he took Moses up and said, get a good view of it, and you, the rest you can see from up here. Moses didn't resent He did. He would like to have taken them on in, but again, he got up on the mountain. God killed him and had him buried. This day, nobody knows where, he, where he's buried. And the good thing about that is if the children of Israel had buried him, They'd be worshiping him still somewhere in the Middle East today. So again, they, they, these are the four men, and the good news is every one of them can change. Even the normal Christian is in a constant process of change. None of us arrive. And when we reach the full stage of maturity that we're going to reach, then it's a home, home going. And that's good. That's not bad. It's good. All right, so... I went a little longer, but uh, it did me good to hear it. I needed to hear that. Amen. <laughs>